But uh, thank you for uh, inviting me here uh, today to talk about the surgeon's perspective on both aortic and mitral valve. Um, I'm going to kind of cover the ways we think through it and the ways um, uh, that we look for uh, uh, leadership from our echocardiographers and cardiologists in order to figure out the best treatment plan for a patient. So let's start with uh, where it all began. Aortic and mitral valve repair really started with Alain Carpentier from Paris when he gave a, a honored presidential guest address at the AATS meeting in, back in 1983. He called it the French correction. Uh, what, he, what he really focused on was the pathophysiologic triad of aortic and valvular disease. The etiology, which is what causes the disease, the lesions, that's what results from the disease, and the dysfunction, which is what results from the lesions. Let's start with the aortic valve. Uh, we have to understand the functional anatomy before we can talk about ways to repair it. The functional aortic annulus uh, includes the aortic annulus itself, which is the ventricular aortic junction, plus through to the sinotubular junction uh, above the coronaries. It includes the leaflets, the commissures, the sinus of valsalva, and some aortic wall itself. The dysfunction can be classified into uh, uh, three uh, discrete uh, uh, types of abnormalities. Number one, normal leaflet motion. Uh, that is with sinotubular junction or aortic annulus dilatation pulling the valve apart. Excess of leaflet motion, which can be due to cusp prolapse or some sort of commissural disruption or uh, even a perforation. And restricted leaflet motion, which is commissural fusion or valve thickening or calcification. We're gonna focus on the two, uh, first two types in regards to repair. What are the triggers for surgery in regards to aortic regurgitation? Well, the progression is slow and the symptoms develop late. So we need to look for uh, signs of progressive left ventricular overload and adaptive chamber dilatation. If a patient's symptomatic, that's obviously an indication, but an asymptomatic patient whose ejection fraction has fallen or has left ventricular dilatation is also the person to consider uh, a valve repair. Uh, exercise testing can show a decrease in ejection fraction and left ventricular dilatation with exercise. And if a patient has moderate aortic regurgitation and is undergoing another cardiac surgery. There was an excellent study from Oxford looking at cardiac MRI and predicting which patients would need surgery. If the regurgitant fraction was over 33%, then 85% of those patients progressed to surgery within three years or symptomatic. Left ventricular end diastolic volume measured greater than 246 milliliters also improved the predictive capability of the MRI. So aortic valve replacement classically, low morbidity and mortality, excellent late durability, uh, especially in older patients. And it's applicable for all patients with aortic regurgitation, but aortic valve repair, what about that? Well, you can avoid anticoagulation. Um, it can be appropriate for selected patients, but which patients, we'll talk about that. And it requires a dedicated approach. El Khoury from uh, uh, Brussels uh, came up with a functional classification of aortic regurgitation depending on what was causing the problem. Uh, 1A, B, and C are dependent on the aorta itself with normal leaflets, uh, dilation of the sinotubular junction above the valve, pulling it apart, dilation of the sinotubular junction and aortic annulus, as you'd see in Marfan syndrome, or just dilation of the aortic annulus, uh, pulling the leaflets away from uh, coaptation. 1D is a special type of uh, uh, mechanism, and that is perforation of one of the cusps, and I'll show you a couple examples of that. Uh, type two is cusp prolapse, where the aorta itself is normal, and type three is cusp restriction. Here we see a normal aorta and uh, sinotubular junction. Uh, the type 1A is again dilatation of the sinotubular junction pulling the leaflets apart. Type 1B, like you see in a Marfan syndrome, and type 1C, just the aortic annulus itself with a normal sinotubular junction. Here's cusp perforation. Uh, this was a traumatic, uh, traumatic cusp perforation uh, uh, on 1D. And then you can see cusp prolapse, uh, type two, with uh, generally causing an eccentric jet of regurgitation and cusp restriction as we should see in uh, radiation injury, uh, rheumatic disease, um, or calcific disease. So what are the principles of aortic valve repair? Uh, well, one is to 
Uh, the, the overarching goal is to create and support an optimal surface for coaptation of the leaflets. We can remodel and stabilize the proximal and distal ends of the functional aortic annulus in types 1A through 1C. Uh, and then we have to repair abnormal cusps and restore their normal geometry uh, in uh, types uh, 1D and 2. Here's type 1A, sinotubular junction dilatation, pulling the tricuspid aortic valve uh, apart, causing a central jet because it's a, a, a symmetrical dilatation of the aorta above the valve. In this patient, what we did was ascending aortic replacement only with a uh, 34 millimeter uh, Dacron graft. And we were able to pull the sinotubular junction back to a normal uh, anatomy. There was no involvement of the root. And you can see on the post-operative TEE, there's now good coaptation with no regurgitation. Here's a type 1B. This is what we see with Marfan syndrome or aorta, uh, annulo aortic ectasia. Uh, there's normal cusp motion, but they're pulled apart at both areas and generally, again, uh, yield a central jet of severe uh, regurgitation. In this patient, we did a valve sparing aortic root replacement. You can see we reimplant the valve inside of the tube, preserving the leaflets. Um, we've been doing this uh, since Tyrone David first uh, presented it back in 1993 and uh, we can have excellent uh, uh, results and excellent long-term results. Um, before I left WashU, I put together a, my series of 177 patients who had a valve sparing root replacement, and we presented this at one of our national meetings. What we found predicted uh, recurrence over time or the presence of regurgitation over time uh, uh, was how much effective height we had. The effective height is how we uh, put the distance from the top of the coaptation down to the annulus. And um, if we had effective height greater than 11 millimeters or greater than 10 millimeters, that was protective against aortic valve reintervention. Let's look at type 1C. That's dilatation of the aortic annulus. Uh, there have been various techniques to address this, some more uh, successful than others. Suture annuloplasty has been uh, attempted to pull the annulus together. Um, that doesn't usually have great long-term results. An external aortic ring can be combined with a valve sparing procedure uh, to bring the annulus back to a normal diameter. Subcommissural plasty is um, uh, an older technique that has some benefit, but not, not overwhelming if there's truly dilatation of the uh, annulus. The new geometric internal ring, I'm gonna show uh, a video of how how that's implanted in a minute. So type 1D is cuff perforation or vegetation. And this is a patient of, of mine from a years ago that had a uh, just a vegetation present on one of the leaflets. We were able to reconstruct that leaflet uh, with some uh, uh, glutaraldehyde tan pericardium and get a good long-term result. And non-infectious perforations, obviously, this, was, this one was after a minimally invasive mitral valve repair where one of the uh, wi guide wires for a balloon occluder uh, went through the leaflet and we were able to fix that with a patch as well. Let's look at leaflet prolapse. Here's a tricuspid valve on the left. You can see this one has isolated right coronary cusp prolapse. There's free margin elongation and there's a transverse fold uh, causing discontinuity of the normal curvature of the cusp as it's supposed to go down. The other two leaflets are actually uh, normal. And then a bicuspid valve, um, you can, uh, there are three different types I'll show you in a minute, um, but prolapse is the most common cause of aortic regurgitation with a bicuspid valve. How can we repair by, uh, uh, valves that are, uh, have prolapse? Well, we can do free margin resuspension. That's if there's like a commissure tear, we, we can do this, uh, and, and the leaflet's gotten too long on its free margin. We can do free margin plication, which is what's demonstrated in that picture. And I'll show you a video of how we do that in a more complex case. And cleft closure, that's how we bring the conjoined tendon, I mean, the conjoined leaflet of the bicuspid valve up to the right height, because it's essentially the leaflets are falling down and not staying up high enough. And so we have to raise the height. Uh, patch repair for perforation, I showed you an example of. The other ones are a bit more complex. So here's a case of a commissural disruption. This is a patient uh, we took to the operating room, 42-year-old gentleman, new murmur. He had all the criteria on MRI. And what we did was took a um, very fine Gore-Tex suture, did a double layer on that one leaflet, and were able to pull it up to the right height and uh, repair that uh, gentleman's aortic regurgitation. 
Here's a bicuspid prolapse case. Um, uh, the uh, uh, aortic annulus and the sinotubular junction were not dilated. This was only a valvular problem. And you can see the prolapse of the leaflets on the uh, uh, non-color imaging, and then the very severe um, eccentric jet of aortic regurgita regurgitation this uh, 39-year-old gentleman had. So uh, here's the classification system. A type two Sievers is essentially, there's no raffe, it's just two leaflets. Uh, the type one Sievers has a raffe with the conjoined uh, leaflets. And a type two is essentially a, a unicuspid uh, type valve. Um, and again, uh, uh, Hans Joachim Schaefer's written a lot on aortic valve repair, um, and he, he reported that in aortic re repair alone, similar to what we found with valve sparing root replacement, that the effective height uh, was important to uh, uh, prevent recurrence. So let's look at this geometric internal ring. This is something very new that we can use to support a repair. Otherwise, the leaflet had to be support the, the leaflet itself um, had to be repaired, uh, uh, and you had to count on a normal aortic annulus in order to support that repair. We're going to talk about cleft closure of the conjoined tendon, um, and you can see in the far right example that's what what we're going to demonstrate. So here's here's a case that's about three minutes long, uh, showing you how we do this aortic valve repair. We size with a Hagar dilator, and you can see the bicuspid valve. Um, and what, uh, this is the sizing uh, apparatus for this ring uh, that measures the uh, commissure to commissure length so that we get the right size. What we do is uh, mark the spot below the commissure where we're going to secure the uh, geometric ring. And we put some sutures around the commissure. This will be two uh, different sutures because there's two struts to the, to the device and, and you'll see it here in a short second. Uh, these sutures are felted, but they're not a standard felt you would see in an operating room. These are a special felt that uh, do not uh, interact or uh, cause fibrosis. So here comes the ring down into position. Uh, we secure one of the struts underneath one of the commissures, and then we're going to secure the other strut. This is a uh, horizontal mattress suture that we place into the strut and bring it through the other side of the commissure underneath the valve so we don't disrupt the valve and then we're able to secure uh, the ring. And so it's a double suture technique. And you would think, well, is that gonna hold this thing in place? Well, not in and of itself. It gets it into the right position and I'll show you what we need to do in order to make sure it doesn't uh, rock around after repair. So we get it down into position in the outflow tract and it's actually elliptical. The shape of the outflow tract, and most of us think, oh, that's a, uh, that's a circle. Well, it's not a circle, it's an ellipse. And so this, this uh, device is uh, designed specifically uh, to uh, accommodate that, that ellipse. So here you can see a suture being placed underneath the ring. You can see the ring below the leaflet. And we're gonna take that suture and we're gonna essentially wrap it around that uh, strut of the, or that uh, bottom ring uh, to secure it in place. So you can see the suture wrapping around and we put about uh, seven or nine of those sutures, depending on the size of the ring. So we tie those down. And also there's a specific thing we do with the, with the knots. We take a suture and move the knot out laterally so that the, uh, the ends of the sutures, the tips of the sutures after tying and cut, cutting uh, are away from the leaflet so they can't poke a hole in it. So we do that and secure the ring in place. Now we're gonna do the leaflet repair. And this is the non-conjoined, um, the leaflet, the one without a raffe, uh, but it, it, it was prolapsing as well. So what I'm gonna do is put a plication suture and uh, 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 on one side of the leaflet, and we're gonna do it on the other side of the leaflet in order to get it uh, to the height we want. It's, remember, it's all about height. It, you know, when I first started uh, thinking about aortic regurgitation, I, I, I thought there was just too much leaflet and that was the problem. But the problem is that the leaflet goes low. Now here's, the, uh, uh, the pseudo raffe in the conjoined uh, leaflet. And what we're going to do then is a, again, a plication suture. And that's gonna be the start of our uh, left closure. Uh, but what we're gonna do is put a series of these in order to, again, elevate the leaflet to the appropriate height. And these patients uh, uh, do ideally have a gradient to their valve. They can, it's uh, like most bicuspid patients uh, will have some gradient. Uh, 
uh, but ideally we're shooting for about 12 uh, millimeters of mercury. So I'm looking, still that leaflet is a little bit low. So we're gonna put one more suture uh, to uh, close the cleft again and uh, uh, bring the leaflet to the appropriate height. And the portion of the, the leaflet that's repaired is going to be outside of, outside of coaptation. So it's not going to injure the other leaflet. The two portions of the leaflet that are, that are going to coapt together, hopefully for, for this 39 year old gentleman for the next 50 years um, are just smooth leaflet tissue. So um, that's, here's the uh, echocardiogram and you can see in the middle image, you can see nicely uh, where the plication sutures are. And, um, and you can see, obviously, there's no regurgitation. Uh, restricted leaflet motion, uh, fibrosis, that uh, uh, calcified bicuspid valves and unicuspid valves, these generally are not ones to, uh, to repair. The durability is not uh, long uh, in that regard. And uh, here's a patient with a combined lesion. He had both 1A and 2. So he had dilatation of a sinotubular junction and bileaflet prolapse. There's a 23 year old gentleman. Do we really want to put a valve in him? No, um, not if we can avoid it. So uh, here's another minute or so of a video. I just want to show you this, uh, how we do this uh, um, without a ring. You don't have to put a ring in. If the aortic annulus is a normal uh, diameter, we can just do a leaflet repair and, um, and uh, uh, hope that, uh, that the aortic annulus won't dilate with time, which it doesn't generally. If it's not dilated at the time of repair, uh, it generally doesn't dilate over time. So here we are at uh, uh, doing a cleft closure, trying to get to the appropriate height on that leaflet. Again, with multiple sutures on that conjoined leaflet. And then we're running um, a suture down the repair to uh, buttress it. So we have um, now that leaflet repaired and we'll check the height to make sure it's correct. It doesn't need another suture. Um, and I, you can see I put application on the other leaflet as well, like we did in the previous case. We can see it uh, uh, looks, looks quite good at a water test. Then we put a, a tube graft to replace the dilated ascending aorta, because remember this was a type 1A and a type 2, and then we have a, a nice result. And the echocardiogram shows uh, no regurgitation. You can see the plication points, but again, that's not causing traumatic coaptation because all that um, uh, uh, hyper uh, echogenic uh, portions of the repair are outside coaptation, not along the coaptation point. So uh, let's talk about the mitral valve now. Uh, it's again, the same thing, uh, pathophysiologic triad of etiology, the cause of the disease, lesions, what results from the disease and dysfunction, which is what results from the lesions. Uh, the functional anatomy of the mitral valve is a, is a little bit more complex. We have the annulus, the leaflets, cordae tendineae, papillary muscles, and left ventricular wall. And I'm going to talk about the abnormalities in all of those and how we address them. Annular lesions can be, do, uh, can be caused by dilatation, as you can see, a dilated annulus in that upper right, or a calcific annulus, uh, which can restrict uh, the capability of the leaflet uh, to close. And you can have sym symmetrical dilatation, as you see in dilated cardiomyopathy or prolonged periods of atrial fibrillation or asymmetric dilatation uh, as in figure C, uh, which occurs with ischemia. This is a pay, uh, uh, all the pictures of this point were from St. Louis, but uh, here's a patient um, of uh, Dr. George's who had aortic regurgitation. She had a dilated uh, uh, annulus and you can see the leaflets on the 3D image are just not coapting, causing quite severe regurgitation. Uh, this patient also though had uh, dilatation of the tricuspid annulus causing uh, at least moderate, if not severe regurgitation. And it's important to remember in the tricuspid valve that it's the portion of the anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflet that dilates. Uh, the septal leaflet portion uh, generally doesn't dilate. And that's, that, that means we don't have to put sutures down there all the way across the septal leaflet because that's where we can get into uh, more trouble uh, with heart block. So in this patient, we put a, a 28 millimeter semi-rigid mitral valve uh, band and a 28 millimeter semi-rigid tricuspid valve band. We also did left atrial ligation with a clip um, as our left, atri uh, uh, le left uh, atrial appendage uh, was quite large and the left atrium was large. Um, and uh, we 
got a good result with no regurgitation. She's going home today. The rings can be either a rigid ring, that's the classic original that Carpentier developed. Um, uh, a flexible band is also an option. Um, and I like to use bands preferentially because uh, uh, remember I said in the tricuspid valve the septal portion doesn't dilate. Well, in the mitral valve, the portion between the trigones in the anterior leaflet doesn't dilate. So uh, supporting a repair can be done with a, uh, uh, a band alone. If you have um, uh, ischemia though, that's one I would use a full ring. Let's look at the leaflets and chordae tendineae. Leaflet lesions are, uh, can be cleft tear or tear, uh, vegetation or perforation, thickening, commissure fusion, or calcification. Chordae tendineae can be elongated, ruptured, or, or as we see with rheumatic disease, thickened, fused, and shortened. First, we have to define non-pathologic clefts. These are clefts that are natural in the um, valve. They're between P1 and P2 and between P2 and P3. They're supported by cords. They essentially function like commissures to open the valve and facilitate it opening wide. They don't extend to the annulus. That's what uh, makes them non-pathologic. A pathologic cleft can occur in the anterior leaf, like the picture above, um, and that's a congenital abnormality. Um, and you can also see one in the posterior leaf down below, uh, causing severe regurgitation. And there's a, um, an image of us putting a stitch, the first stitch into that cleft which we'd run all the way down to the annulus uh, to complete the repair. Vegetations and perforations. Here's, here's a vegetation that, uh, that I had uh, previously. And what we did was that involved a portion of the leaflet and we were able to resect out that portion of the leaflet. Um, and the other image is a patient uh, here in the hospital that we're operating on soon uh, after some other workup with, uh, that we should be able to do a repair on as well. Anterior lateral fusion or double commissural fusion occurs with uh, rheumatic change or calcification. Um, and uh, commissurotomy is what we would do to uh, address this. Or we can get fibrosis of the leaflet. Here's a restricted posterior leaflet in a 52-year-old gentleman, end-stage renal disease, um, uh, that caused quite severe regurgitation. But while the posterior leaflet was fibrosed, this patient's anterior leaflet was quite normal. So we put in a downsizing band and we're able to eliminate that gentleman's regurgitation, which is great in a patient with end-stage renal disease because then we didn't have to put in a tissue valve or a deal with uh, uh, anticoagulation from a mechanical valve. The spectrum of degenerative disease goes from fibroelastic deficiency to fibroelastic deficiency plus to the form frost to a full-blown Barlow's, which involves both leaflets. And I'm going to show you examples of all these. Here's a flail mitral valve in an 87-year-old gentleman, uh, P2 ruptured cord. Um, essentially, it was, it was the cord that was ruptured, but the leaflet itself was not enlarged. So what can we do in that patient? We can do a triangular resection of the portion. There are other ways to repair it, but this is what I classically do. A triangular resection of the portion with the flail cord, uh, and then reconstruct the leaflet back together and support it with a ring. We always support it with a ring um, uh, just to prevent, uh, just to improve coaptation because there's always some annular dilatation um, uh, with uh, prolonged regurgitation. So here's a good result postoperatively. It can also be not necessarily just P2. Um, here's a P3 flail in a 38-year-old uh, gentleman with a ruptured cord causing quite eccentric jet. And in him, we did a limited triangular resection P3 has, is, needs a little bit more support usually than uh, P2 um, as there's not as many surrounding cords. So we did an A3, P3, Alfieri stitch, um, uh, which Carpentier used to call a magic stitch, uh, where we just uh, reapproximate the leaflets, an edge to edge. And we put in a band to support. Anterior leaflet prolapse is something that um, for surgeons, when you're starting to learn, out, learn how to do um, uh, repairs, you generally start with ring onlys, then you start with P P2s, then you can go to other portions of the posterior leaflet. Anterior leaflet is kind of the last area to address because uh, it's the most complex. Here's an anterior leaflet flail, a 54-year-old gentleman. Uh, he had ruptured A2 uh, cord. Uh, and for this gentleman, we put uh, three neocords um, and also put in a band to support. 
and we're able to get that the anterior leaflet to the appropriate height and no longer prolapsing. Here's an 83 year old woman. Uh, here's fibroelastic uh, elastic deficiency plus. That's where not only do you have an abnormality of the cord, but you have leaflet abnormality, excessive height or width or bulk of the leaflet itself. So in this case, we have to take out more than just a, a limited triangular resection. In this patient, we did a quadrangular resection, reapproximated the uh, uh, annulus to, to, in, to do a plication, uh, and then reconstructed the leaflet itself, post-op, no regurgitation. Here's a form thrust. Here's a 62-year-old woman with uh, uh, dyspnea exertion. Uh, this is a, uh, um, uh, a, a patient uh, from here. Uh, that uh, we took care of um, a week or two ago uh, with severe regurgitation and a, a very abnormal valve. Intraoperatively on the 3D echo, we saw both P1 and P2 were involved. You can see on the, um, the intraoperative image, the, the excess of width in both P1 and P2. So not only can we do we need to resect P2, like we did with the other patient, but the height of P1 is too high. So what we've got to do is lower the height of that uh, leaflet. And so what we do is called a sliding plasty, where we cut below the leaflet edge so that we can move it over um, and then reapproximate the valve uh, leaflets the way we had did before. And we get a, a, a patient with no regurgitation. She also had a maze procedure as well. Uh, and here's a form thrust with P1, P2, and P3 abnormalities. You can see essentially there's a functional double cleft on the 3D image and the 3D uh, color image shows exactly the, that phenomenon. So what we did in this patient is we did a quadrangular resection to debulk P2, but then P1 and P3 were also too high. So we did a sliding plasty towards P1 and a sliding plasty towards P3. And we were able to bring the leaflets together in the middle and uh, eliminate the regurgitation. The anterior leaflet was normal. Well, what if it's not? Here's a 50-year-old woman with uh, congestive heart failure, severe MR with multiple jets. Intraoperatively, we assessed the, the valve and essentially all of these, uh, uh, all of these uh, segments of the, both the posterior and anterior leaflets uh, were billowing. So we take it one step at a time. One lesion uh, uh, takes one technique to repair. We did a triangular P1 resection. To, to downsize P1, we did a P2 sliding plasty. We closed the P2, P3 cleft. We put a P3 neocord. We did an A3, P3 alfieri stitch and put on a 33 millimeter band. And we had a good result and were able to repair that valve uh, in, in that complex uh, setting. Here's one more, 81 year old gentleman, congestive heart failure. Um, uh, he's actually a physician. He's actually uh, waiting preoperative He's got severe mitral regurgitation with multiple jets. He's got uh, permanent persistent atrial fibrillation. You can see the anterior leaflet is prolapsing. The posterior leaflet is prolapsing. And you can see on the color images, uh, there's multiple jets coming out of that valve. So this, this is another one that's gonna take multiple um, uh, techniques to get it repaired. Uh, but I'm, I'm uh, optimistic we'll be able to get that valve repaired. Uh, it's next week, wish me luck. So it, you can see on his 3D images that uh, the, the P2 is um, pro, uh, prolapsed, P1 is prolapsed, A2 and A3 look strange, and there's quite a wide jet in the middle. Um, and he also has some tricuspid regurgitation as one might expect with longstanding uh, mitral regurgitation. Let's look at the papillary muscles now. Um, Here's a ruptured posterior medial papillary muscle, a 62 year old gentleman with acute myocardial infarction. You can see it creates a, just a massive acute jet. This is a sick patient. These, these, they, these can't really wait. Um, this is the one mitral valve operation you need to do in the middle of the night. But uh, we were able to get that, that uh, papillary muscle reconstructed um, and actually buttress it with some uh, uh, suture, uh, Gore-Tex uh, neocords, and we're able to get that valve repaired uh, sparing that guy a, a mitral, mitral valve replacement. Let, let's uh, end up with the left ventricular wall. There's a couple different things we have to address. One is restricted posterior uh, motion with a chronic ischemic uh, disease change. Uh, you can see on the pre-op image at the top, uh, black and white, 
a posterior leaflet, it doesn't even look like he's got a posterior leaflet. Um, and that's causing quite severe odd jet of regurgitation. But in this case, we put in a 28 uh, millimeter, what's called an ischemic mitral regurg ring, uh, and uh, that is asymmetrical in its uh, shape. And we were able to eliminate his regurgitation as well. And then finally, systolic anterior motion. This is a patient from just this week, septal hypertrophy, uh, 70. Three-year-old woman, acute short, shortness of breath, coronary artery disease, paroxysmal AFib, left ventricular outflow tract gradient greater than fifty. This is a, this is a complicated situation physiologically, not only preoperatively and intraoperatively, but postoperatively, because not only is the septum thickened, but the whole ventricle is thickened, and you can still get outflow tract uh, problems uh, postoperatively. Um, uh, unless you have good control of uh, the afterload and, and uh, anotropic state of the ventricle. So in this patient, we did a myectomy, uh, put a true size band on. Uh, the leaflets of the mitral valve were not normal. Uh, they were a bit abnormal, uh, but the, the regurgitation wasn't severe enough to, to warrant us uh, replacing it. Pulmonary vein isolation, left atrial appendage ligation with the atroclip, and uh, uh, a bypass to her LAD. So you can see on the, the post-op images, the left ventricle outflow tract, there's a, the septum would be inferiorly and you can see it staying out of the outflow tract and you can see the flow image uh, demonstrating a, a nice a wide open uh, outflow tract during systole. Now again, post-operatively, these patients, if we let their blood pressure get low, um, that can lead again to collapse of the outflow tract. And so it's uh, important to maintain their uh, uh, vasoactive state. And these were, this is, this is in, uh, intraoperatively, but off pump uh, measuring simultaneous uh, aortic and left ventricular pressures. And you can see that we have a, a, a peak to peak gradient of 13, which is uh, what we're uh, shooting for less than, less than 15 to 20 uh, to 25 ideally. So, the principles for success in aortic and mitral valve repair, number one, the goal of valve is to assess the valve. You got to establish a pre precise diagnosis, preoperative echo, then intraoperative echo, then visualization. Determine the most appropriate treatment op option. If you're a surgeon that doesn't do complex mitral valve repairs, um, either please learn to do them or uh, please consider transfer to a reference center because uh, uh, certainly a, a, a mitral valve repair at least in my opinion, is much better for a patient than a replacement. Now, obviously, patients need to have their valve replaced if they're uh, fibrotic and scarred in, calcified annulus. Uh, but um, I think most people are shifting towards repair whenever possible. You'd have to do a segmental valve analysis, uh, localize and categorize all the dysfunction, do a complete inventory of the specific lesions. Sure, it may be complicated if you got P1, P2, A3, A2, all prolapsed, but take them one at a time and address them one at a time, one lesion for one technique. So thanks again for inviting me uh, to be here today. Uh, it's been a lot of fun.